The world doesn't think that the gospel can change your life, but we know that it can. And that's why we want you to hear these stories, stories of transformation, stories of freedom, people getting free from sin and healed from sin because of Jesus. This is Death to Life. Somewhere along the way, I adopted this mentality, this this notion that Jesus was somehow like convincing the Father to step in the way of me, to satisfy this unquenchable wrath for sinners like me, the trash that I was. So he would step in the way. Unknowingly, I adopted that notion and that the Father hates me. So Jesus stands in the way. God the Father is so disgusted with me. He sent Jesus to stand in my place. I'm this disgusting thing. But because Jesus died for my sins, uh, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see me. He sees Jesus. Because I'm revolting. Yo, welcome to the Death to Life podcast. Your friendly neighborhood podcast. My name is Richard Young. And this episode is with my brother Didier. I think I said it right. It's a French name. I've known Didier since... 2022 man uh he is a wonderful loving dude he's a humongous human being he's like six six uh you're not gonna be able to tell that by hearing the podcast but you can you can hear his huge heart for people and how he's been changed by being loved and so uh let's get into this episode this is Didi. Buckle up, strap in. Love y'all. Appreciate y'all. So, um, Dee Dee, where does it begin, my boy? Where does the story start? Oh How man, far are we going back. Where'd you we have are... to jot it down on your notes? Uh, so my story begins um, really with my parents. Um, my mom is born was born in Panama. Um, in the country of Panama, in Panama City. And my father was born in Paris, France. Um, they were raised Yo, we might in... be related, dog. We might be related. <laughs> Seriously, my abuelita is Panamanian. There we go. Uh, we, like, we probably are related, dog. I I would hope so. Um, so my my mom's family was raised in a broken home, very broken home, and my dad was too. So... Um, In the 70s, my parents both, um, without knowing each other, moved to a little town called Miami, Florida. And they attended a a community college, and my parents met each other there. My dad learned Spanish to talk to my mom, and he was a polyglot. And so... What is that? they, They... He spoke a lot of languages. He learned English pretty fast. He learned... Spanish. He spoke Creole. Um, pretty much any romance language. But his first language is, is French. Yeah, his first language. Did he speak Portuguese? No, but you would think he did. But so he had the ability to communicate with a lot of people and with my mom especially. So in the eighties, um, they had my brother and I. Um, I am the oldest of two. Um, my parents, like I said, they came from two very broken homes so they tried to give my brother and I what they didn't have which was a stable home they worked very hard at that and it was stable um for some reason from an early age I just had this strange anxiety um to things and so like if I went to the doctor (laughs) I was like four years old and the doctor put the p- blood pressure cuff on me and I would freak out and my blood pressure was through the roof and the test would say like, oh, he has high blood pressure and I'm four and the person's like, okay, he just has anxiety. Um, and that, that was something that stuck with me for a long time. Um, my parents were very helpful with my brother and I as far as, far as spiritual things. Um, they took us to church. They paid for church school eventually, but they never took part in church themselves they would like drop us off and then like go do stuff and then when church was over they would like guesstimate when church was over and they'd come and pick us up um so my brother and i had a very strange upbringing what church just they would pick a random church no so my grandmother this is the 
the big part of my early life was my grandmother. My grandmother was the matriarch. All roads led to my grandmother and my family. And my, my mom's mom. I wasn't very close to my dad's family because they didn't live in the States. But all of my mom's family ended up living in the States, in Miami. So I was very close to my mom's family. My grandmother was the matriarch. She was extremely religious. Like her middle name should have been Seventh Day Adventist because like, like that was her, yeah, like Jonathan, like that was her identity. Um, she was really passionate about the Bible, really passionate about Adventism, but like Hispanic Adventism, which was this super conservative, um, dare I say, works-based situation. Um, she was really passionate about one subject from early on in my life. She was very passionate about prophecy. Like prophecy was everything. So imagine, I'm sure you're familiar with this, um, Net 97 with Mark Finley. Um, we went to a Spanish church where they had a massive satellite and they had someone translating it to Spanish, uh, Hialeah, uh, SDA, which I don't even know if that even exists anymore. Um, but yeah, we would watch Net 97. She didn't even know how to say Dwight K. Nelson's name for Net 98, but like we were there. And uh, it was everything. Nelson. Was, <laughs> Dwight K. Nelson. And so, uh, yeah, when, when Net 98 happened, like, Something happened and like she really became convicted. Her and my grandfather um, became really convicted about leaving the cities because right around the corner was this crazy thing that was going to happen. Y2K. And so she's like, we're getting Ellen White says to get out of the cities. So we're going to get out of the cities. We're going to dig a well and we're going to get our own water so that, you know, when stuff goes down, you know, we have access to water. She started canning aggressively. Um, and uh, yeah, and so she kept all of her canning stuff because when the time of trouble came, she had to be ready. Um, she would buy Adventist stuff. She would listen to Adventist pastors. Um, one specific one, Hugo Gambetta. My grandmother was a huge fan of Hugo Gambetta. <laughs> And uh, we used to listen to his sermons all the time. That there's a, there's a specific way that he said Babylon in Spanish that I cannot get out of my head ever since I was a kid. As he said. Babylonia. Anyway, so um, she bought these, DV these tapes, these VHS tapes called Keepers of the Flame. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. But it's like a blow-by-blow -blow story of like the history of the Protestant church and then the Adventist church. And the imagery was... Amazing. Amazing is maybe not the right word. Um, so that like it's going through prophecy and she's teaching us about prophecy. And she's like, look, there's a woman in Revelation and she's running through the de desert in the wilderness and the dragon is chasing her. And the dragon that appears on screen is Darth Vader chasing a woman. And I'm just like, this is unreal. Like, what is happening right now? So like I'm, you know, learning about Are the being serious. Church. It was Darth Vader. I was, I have, I, wa I went back today and I watched the link again because I thought I was making it up. It's on YouTube. Um, it, there's literal Darth Vader with a sword chasing a woman through the desert. Um, it's wild. Bro, how anyway. trippy would it be if that's how it actually is? Right, <laughs> exactly. A <laughs> woman dressed in white looking like uh, Leia quite a bit, um, except for the little cinnamon rolls in her mm -hmm. head. But and then Darth Vader running after her. It was wild. Um, so she was really passionate about like Adventism and learning about, you know, prophecy, like as a, from a very young age, like I, instead of like liking superheroes and, you know, Batman, I, I was more concerned about the state of the dead. Like that was the thing that mattered, you know, because my grandmother made it the number one thing she taught us. And she would tell us like, you know, if you meet people that try to tell you, you know, here, here's a story that I can say. Um, she had a deep, deep, this, you know, just a, she was Catholic, she was raised Catholic. And one day an Adventist woman found her and told her the gospel. And she 
was ever since then, she was very, very resentful of Catholics because she was like, I lived devoted to this thing that made no sense, at least biblically. You know, that was her interpretation. Mm -hmm. And so she would tell us things about Catholicism. And the fruit of all of this was that one day, I was about six or seven years old, maybe a little bit older. Um, I had my first and only friend as a kid was a girl named Mariluz. And Mariluz was Catholic. She was the daughter of one of my mom's work friends. And it came time for her first communion. And when my grandmother heard about this, it was, it, she held a meeting at my house with my brother and I. She said, look, I can't stop you from going to this, but if you're going to go, there's some things you need to know. Okay. First of all, the Eucharist, that's not a thing. It's not literal. Second, uh, don't ever cross yourself on the basketball court or in the church. And I'm like, I'm just kidding. I don't, she didn't say that, but like, seriously, like she was like, never do this thing, you know, never do that is idolatry. That's pagan. And they're going to tell you to do this. And they're going to tell you to stand up and they're going to tell you to do all these things. Don't do it. And so obviously my anxiety kicks in the day of and I'm shaking, like I'm in front of this church, this cathedral or whatever it's called. And I am shaking. Like I'm thinking I'm about to walk into enemy territory. Like it, it was, I was scared straight. You know, I, I went in there. <laughs> sure enough, they were trying to make us do a bunch of stuff. And I don't remember all of it, but like I was just on edge the whole time, you know. Um, but it wasn't healthy, man. This kind of mentality of, you know, us versus them and because all of the prophecy stuff that my grandmother focused on was just like, you know, anyway. So the, the fruit of that also ended up coming out like in school. Um, I remember in third grade, I had this friend named Katrina and she was new to the school and I was trying to befriend her because she was nice. And um, of course, the first question I had was, what, what religion are you? And she's like, I'm Catholic. And I was like, oh, snap. Oh my goodness. Now I got to lay a word on you. So, um, where are your relatives right now? The ones that died. And she's like, uh, they're in heaven watching me. And I'm like, no, 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 they're not. They're dead. Like really dead. The dead know nothing. Okay. That's what my grandmother told me. And the girl's like, um, are you sure? And I'm like, no, they're dead. They're really dead. This is what God has told me to tell you. They're dead. Like, like they're really dead. She starts crying, like crying. The next day she comes back to school and the teacher's like, hey, DDA, you shouldn't be talking about stuff like that. People disagree on how that all that works. And I'm like, well, just as long as she knows that her dead relatives are really dead, like dead. <laughs> and dude, there was no love. There was no love. You, teacher, but as long as she is heartbroken, <laughs> that her that's what I want. She needs to understand. So it was this loveless judgment that I had for people. And slowly, slowly, the gospel became something I bludgeoned people with, especially myself. There was no, it no wasn't love. The gospel, bro. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't the gospel. It was just this thing that I thought was, was the gospel. The real gospel was Doctor. Far, 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 far better. So it was all fear-based, man. Uh, don't do this mm -hmm. because you'll lose salvation. Don't go to church. I mean, don't go to the theaters because, you know, God leaves you at the door. Like, you know, you can't go and be doing foolish things. Uh, you don't eat this because Ellen White says that you shouldn't be eating this and mixing this with this. Um, and, of course, when my grandmother gave us the full lecture on the end times and prophecy and all that kind of stuff, it freaked me all the way out. Um, and so... You know, growing up in Miami in the 90s, I'm half Panamanian, half French, living in a culture where I don't look like most Hispanics. People from Miami thought I was from India or Pakistan. Um, and so they would, you know, they would never assume that I was Hispanic. I didn't speak English when I started school. I only spoke Spanish. I had to take ESL for kindergarten first and most of second grade um, because I just didn't speak any English whatsoever. Um, so my identity was always like, well, I don't really know who I am because I don't really fit anywhere. Um, being extremely religious didn't make me very popular either. Um, and especially for a third grader, um, I was tall though. Um, I remember in third grade, I was five, three, 
And I remember 5-3 being important because at the time, the shortest player in the NBA, Muggsy Bogues, no, Muggsy oh, Bogues, Bogues at the time. was 5-3, played for the Charlotte Hornets. And so I was like, I'm at least as tall as someone who's in the NBA, and I'm in third grade. Um, you, you were in third grade taller than my wife. <laughs> Like my uh, wife see, is Kim Kim Kardashian and my wife, they're both like five, two and a half. Uh, that is hysterical. In third grade, you were taller third than, grade. Than, than than them. Yeah, that's bro. freakish. That's it. I'm is, not calling you, you a freak. No, it is. And you know what's even crazier is my son is even taller than that. Well, not that, but he's taller than I was at his age. How so, old is your son again? Five. I'm gonna get to that. And how, and what is it? And he's like six foot now. Exactly. When I met him, I was like, "Like, how's your fourteen-year-old son?" He's like, "He's he's six, Rich." He like, he actually was three. he was four at the time, and I was like, "Man, this kid!" And he just gets bigger. He's sixty pounds. Anyway, anyway, I digress. I thought he was your I, dad. It, my dad wasn't that tall. He was about six one. Um. Uh, so yeah. Um. My mom is five ten. What are you? Six five, five? Six six? How tall? I'm are you? six six. I'm six. Depending on what shoes I'm wearing, probably about six six. Um, naturally I okay. grew a lot, but like my interests were not aligned with societies. So like in spelling class, when the teacher's asking, how do you spell this? I would raise my hand and I would say, did you know that in April of 1912, the Titanic sank in the North Atlantic ocean? Cause I was obsessed with the Titanic, like obsessed before the movie, before the fanfare. Like I was an original Titanic, like obsessive person. Because of my dad. My dad loved the Titanic. He loved ships. He loved, you know, cruise liners. And that was just one of his things. Um, in math naturally. class, she naturally, of course. Um, in math class, to be asking a math question, I'd say, did you know that in 1993, Alan Prost won the Formula One World Championship? And the teachers were like, look, we get that you're a passionate kid, but you have to focus. I just, I, none of my passions aligned. And I didn't know the right time and place to talk about anything. Kind of like this right now. Spanish speaker again didn't really uh, didn't really mix with the people because I didn't look like the people that spoke Spanish in Miami. Um, but slowly, my identity became like, what can I offer the people around me? Because clearly, I can't encumber people with the things that I like. I keep raising my hand in class talking about the things that I love because no one's going to listen to me. At least the teacher might, but then it wasn't the right time. So clearly, I have to adjust myself somehow to fit the. The milieu, to use a French word, the, the surrounding, the, the people around me to, to have something in common with them. So I collected pieces of knowledge that I could like have something to connect with people with because it was lonely just liking the things that I liked, that no one liked. Sports, pop culture, history. I even tried like shoes. Um, it was not very helpful because I couldn't afford the Jordans, the, the 10s or the 11s or the 12s, you know, like the kids had. And so, you know, I was wearing Reeboks, you know, it's just not the same thing. They had one or two good ones. They had one, the pumps, but dude, that was before. Did you ever do Fila's? Did you ever do Fila's? Did you do? I did Fila's and I did Champions. These are like Monarchs, but like Champions worse. is Kmart. Champions is Kmart. Fila's is like a legit brand. Fila's because of uh, Horace Grant and uh, not Horace Grant. Um, oh, Grant Hill, Grant, Grant Hill. Hill, Grant Hill, Grant Hill. Right, right, right. Sorry. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, I collected pieces of knowledge so that I could connect with people. I started listening to different kinds of music, bro. I started watching pop TV, VH1. I was the only boy that I knew in my school that on the day of the release of Spice Girls, the first tape, I went and bought it. I asked my aunt for my birthday. I was like, I need this because it's on TV and it's popular, right? This is popular. People like this, right? The Spice Girls, of course. And I was the only kid. And my brother, who was younger than me, knew how weird it was. And he would be like, you know, that's really weird. I'm like, I don't care. I want to be popular. So, okay. I, well, let's talk about this for a second, though. I'm sure. Did, did you, do, you have, do you have Netflix? I do. Yes. Did did you watch the David Beckham documentary? Richard, you're you're skipping around in my story um, because David Beckham. No, was my but first I want to make this point. David Beckham was my first soccer idol. No, okay, but I, I want to make this point. 
when they show Posh Spice in the uh, in the wannabe music video, did we ever realize that she doesn't sing once? She doesn't sing <laughs> once. And once. Yeah, I, I, I'm watching I, it. Dude, I'm like, when is Posh I, gonna sing? I honestly, I, I'm I glad just, we're having this conversation right now. Absolutely, to talk about absolutely. Um, no, I, yeah, um, Posh. This, it wasn't even them. It was like, I just want to be popular. And if they're popular, I got to know about them because Absolutely. this is what kids like. And I was completely off the pulse. None of my friends cared about the Spice Girls. In fact, they thought they were weird because they were British and we were Americans, kind of, because we're anyway, we're from Miami. Like, we don't care about what they're doing in the UK. OK, like Ricky Martin or whatever. You know, I, I still this day, I don't know Will what Smith. was really popular. Will Smith. Let's just get jiggy with it. Whatever. He had the song about Miami. Uh, welcome to Miami. Bienvenido a Miami. Um, so I, I, I started listening to stuff that just erroneously, thinking it was popular. I just wanted to fit in. Um, and it became pretty obvious to the people around me that I was just desperate for affirmation, some kind of validation. I wanted to be impressive. I wanted to impress people. I wanted to be original. Um, Hmm. The sad, the sad part about all this, and I'm trying to get through the death part because, you know, anyway, uh, I didn't talk about this with anyone for ages because I was convinced for a long time that this actually didn't happen. Um, but when I was in kindergarten, I remember I used to go to uh, lunch and the lunch lady would, um, she would touch me in inappropriate places. And I just remember not understanding what was happening and mm. my brain tried to like block it out for a long time but not that long ago the memory came back to me and i was like oh man this is this is some wild stuff um and it was all in the open idea what was going on i had no idea i thought if you're doing this this must be normal and i must submit to whatever it is that you're telling me to do because i'm a kid i didn't speak english so i couldn't really defend myself um, and so, or speak up about it because none of my teachers, oddly enough in kindergarten, my teacher didn't speak any Spanish. And I didn't know that I had to like make an alarm about this or like raise a fuss and say something was going on. Um, the second thing was, uh, this is the other sad part was that, um, in kindergarten, my first day of school, I met a girl and I thought she was so pretty. So I came home and I told my mom. And my mom made the mistake, which is not in her character to tell family about stuff, but like she told my entire family that I had a, I had a crush on a girl and my family out of relief just inundated me with attention about it. And it made me feel so uncomfortable that I swore I would never tell anyone that I liked a girl ever again, even if I, I would never do it. Cause I, it just, I was so on the spot and embarrassed. And so um, the, the years went by in elementary school. And one day I was under the care of someone and this person was well-meaning, but man, uh, they, they put on some um, LUST on the TV. This person had the little black box where you could get pay-per-view in the nineties. And they put on something, they put on a woman showering um, and they were like, this, this right here, this is good. This is what you should like. This is good and this is natural and it's normal. And my brother and I were there and we we're watching this. And I remember feeling a thrill, like not in anything nefarious, more like, I know I'm not supposed to be seeing this. I'm just curious, like what is happening here? This is so interesting. Apart from that, the whole thing lay dormant. So the years went by and you know, I didn't think anything else of it. Um, but that, that went dormant, I will say. Um, I went to high school. Um, in high school, I went to Greater Miami Academy, class of 2008. GMA. GMA, the Warriors. Um, high school was decent. <clears throat> um, I didn't play sports, which was rough because I was like six foot two in freshman year. And all the basketball coaches are like, do you understand what we could do with you on our team? And I'm like, dog, I'm sorry. 
I don't really like that much. I don't like basketball. I'm not that good at it. I'm very awkward. I'm not, it's not my thing. And they're like, come on, just join the team. And I'm like, nah, I'm good. Um, and so like people would look at me and they, be like, man, you're such a waste of height. <laughs> I was like, oh. whew, my goodness. Okay. So like, I couldn't fit in there either. So I was like, I'm going to get, I'm going to learn about different cultures. So of course, like any kid in the late nineties, early two thousands, that wasn't really into sports. I started getting into anime and, uh, watching Toonami naturally. naturally watching Toonami. When I got home, the thrill that I would feel watching Dragon Ball Z is full. Um, so my brother and I would just like, oh, Dragon Ball Z was our thing. Then we got into more deep anime, you know, more obscure anime that was dubbed and et cetera. But um, Miami culture just wasn't my thing. Clubbing, you know, the vanity, it just, it didn't suit me. Um, and I kept looking for an identity that I could put on. Um, I got a job at the ABC, the Adventist Book Center. So I got discounts. When you're in Miami. Oh. Yes. What comes with Miami? The Adventist Book Center. They have in this book center, bro. <laughs> I had discounts to all the best veggie meat. Like, uh, oh, you guys, you want a you want a Jamie George CD for eight ninety nine? I got you, fam. Say less, <laughs> bro. I remember, I remember, because Miami we don't have white people, so like, I remember going to the music section and seeing like Avalon, and I'm like, what is this? Like, do you all look like that girl that Chandler dated in like season five of Friends? Like. What is going on? I had never seen these people before. Because all I see is Hispanics. You know, I like I said, I had the best discounts on like all the veggie meat, fried chick, golden croquettes. What you know about golden croquettes, bro? Man, what you it, know about that dinner roast? I bet you were smashing that for Thanksgiving, though. Roast, meatless wham, prosage links, big franks. Let's go. So oh, wow. that was that was I didn't have that job for very long um because I sucked at it. I was just, you know not doing what I needed to do because I was 14 years old, well, almost 15, and I didn't really know how to have a job. So I got let go, unfortunately. Wasn't a good fit. Um, fired from the ABC, bro? Fired from the ABC, bro. And the guy who was before me was a legend that went to Southern and was, like, adored. And people were like, we wish you was here. And I'm like, I'm here. And they're like, you suck. And so wow. it was rough. It was rough. Um I, around this time, I was, I'm looking for something to love. So I fall in love with this sport called soccer, football. Um, and the first game I watched was a team in red, but in Manchester United. So I just in 2002, October of 2002, I remember where I was. I remember the moment. And I was like, okay, soccer, this is my thing. I'm not very good at it. I, I'm not, but I want to get good at it. And I started watching the games. Um, Totally single. I had no, no girl interests, partly because like in the humidity of Miami, my hair made me would just puff up like Councilman Jam from Parts and Rec. And so I wasn't the most attractive kid walking around. I, my hair was always, and I had to we get here. to see some photos, dude. We need to see you some will photos. see photos. You will see photos. Okay. Good. Um, my mom and dad would, <laughs> they would buy me really like antiquated looking clothes. Um, so I didn't look cool, um, but in high school, um, if you asked me kind of like what my picture of God was, um, I would say he was this person that was going to come back one day. And I, I was hoping that I would be good enough to earn heaven. You know, that was the picture that I had of what religion was, what, what God was. Um, I, 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 that in high school was where, where lust came back into my life. Um, it wasn't really a thing until at all until my freshman year in high school, when like students would be asking me, like, do you watch the stuff? You know, do you, why don't you like, that's crazy. Like, why wouldn't you watch the stuff? I'm like, I don't even know how to find it. Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? I like geography. <laughs> and they're like, you, you don't, you don't, do things to yourself like what's wrong with you like that's weird i'm like okay well guess i gotta learn how to do this and um 
<laughs> it was this. That's kind of what it was, man. I was like, I have to be normal. How if if I feel this unnormal, I gotta do what's right. making what would make me normal. So twisted. I understand. I know now. No, that's exactly uh, how it was with me. Yeah, just like I guess I gotta learn how to do this. Gotta learn how to do this because everyone does it, and it's weird that I don't. And so I need to be normal. So here's like whatever. Um, and it became something that consumed me uh, right off the bat. Um, it was in high school as well when I had an encounter with someone that I respected very much, a very gregarious person in my family that everyone loved. Um, but this person had a thing and their thing was to find out what your weaknesses were and they would observe you and at the right time, if in case you ever went at them, they kept these cards in their back pocket and they knew how to verbally undress you basically um, when they felt attacked by you. And of course, being so religious and not understanding what the gospel actually was led me to be a very judgmental person, extremely judgmental person. And I went at that person one time and that person, the person said some things to me that I immediately took on as my identity. They said, you are arrogant, you are selfish, and you are an absolute narcissist. And I believed everything that person said. And so Dang. in order to balance the scales of this egregiousness that was who I was, that was my identity, I adopted the identity of absolute trash. I, I am horrible. I, I'm disgusting. I am a horrible person. And that would kind of, in my, in a twisted way, like balance the imbalance of this crazy offensive person that I was told that I was. Hmm. And it was around this time that my grandmother on May 6, 2001, my grandmother was taking some food to a church member who had uh, been hurt and, and couldn't come to church. And so she was taking some food to this person and she got into a car accident and died 15 minutes later. What? And I remember, I remember feeling like, okay, she was my source to God. She was my avenue in the most ironically, like <laughs> way, ironic way. Like she was my avenue to God. She was my source of knowledge of, about religious things, spiritual things. She was my spiritual mentor. I had put her on a pedestal basically. And so when she died, like I had so many questions about my salvation, about my relationship with God, if there would ever be anything like that, because she was gone. Um, it was a huge vacuum in my spiritual life. And so just the way that played out was very sad. It, it, I, I, I didn't know that I, you know, you remember how Harold in his podcast said like, Hispanics don't get depression. We don't have that. What is that? That's that we can't get that. That's yeah, kind that's of how I, for us. it's impossible for us. Um, I, I went through that, that I was like, there's no way I have that, but I would be crying uncontrollably for no reason, you know, over the death of my grandmother. She was such a huge part of my life. Um, and it hurt a lot. So uh, once high school was kind of done and dusted, I had to take a, a moment to like, think about what I had become. You know, I was lost. I was this arrogant narcissistic thing that was disgusting. Th my sin, all of the lust and pride and all those things, that was the evidence of who I was. So somehow along, somewhere along the way, I adopted this mentality, this, this notion that like Jesus Jesus was somehow like convincing the father to step in the way of me to satisfy this unquenchable wrath for sinners like me, the trash that I was, um, and my sin. So he would step in the way. Um, and this weird theology began unknowingly. I, that's not weird. Started, I, I mean, it is weird when you know the truth. That's how it's people extreme. teach it, bro. Yeah, that's it's, how people it, actually. You know what I mean? So. I, I feel like I, I can't pinpoint when it happened. That's the thing. I don't know where I learned that. Um, oh, no, it gets that, baked in. Yeah, and unknowingly, I adopted that notion. And 
that the father hates me. <laughs> so Jesus stands in the way. Hmm. God, the father is so disgusted with me. He sent Jesus to stand in my place. I'm this disgusting thing. But because Jesus died for my sins, uh, he sees Jesus. But he doesn't see me. He sees Jesus because I'm revolting. And this led to some strong questions about, like, why would I have any allegiance to the father? I, I didn't understand what the role was. If this dude loathed me, why, oh, why should I love this guy? I see Jesus. I get Jesus. Like, he, he, he's the one that's my shield and my representative. But why would I care about the father? What, what, that doesn't make any sense. And because of the evidence of my sin, so being so overwhelming, I really began to see myself as sin waiting to happen. Like, just, it's going to happen. It's who I am. Uh, so how is salvation possible? My grandmother told me something before she died. She said, in passing, and it like influenced my, my view of like life and religion so much. She said, you know, when God comes, the only thing that changes is your body. Your, your, your person, the person, your character, that's sealed in Christ. And I was like, oh, oh really? This is the worst. Instead of it sounding like a promise, it sounded like a sentence. Because I was like, there's no way I could be good. There's no way I'm lost. There's no way. It doesn't make any sense. So heaven didn't, that wasn't a, that wasn't even possible for me. Like I, I didn't match up. I didn't, I, I didn't come up to the level that I knew I needed to be somehow. And I couldn't bear that. I couldn't match up. So if it served me in some way, I could go through the motions of being spiritual. But if I wasn't around people that were spiritual, if I had nothing to gain, from being around people or being spiritual around people, you would never know that I was a Christian. Um, because of this, like the gospel became a hammer, a hammer on myself. The, what I thought was the gospel became a hammer on myself. It became a hammer on the people around me. I, I didn't have good news to tell people when they asked me about God, which they seldomly ever did. But when they did, it was just, well, I'm sure that shame and condemnation is how the Holy Spirit talks to you because that has to be it. Cause that's all I feel all the time. And the, the Holy Spirit is disappointed in me. So he's like shaming me into trying to be better, but it's, it, it never works. Fun fact. It never Pe did work. Cause people say that the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. I don't think I've ever sinned and not known it, that the Holy Spirit needed to come and tell me that that was a sin. I don't I think the Holy that. Spirit has ever like tapped me and be like, that uh, was a sin. And I had no idea that no was a clue. sin. I didn't know that looking at porn was a sin. Thank you, Holy Spirit. No, the Holy Spirit convicts of righteousness. Of righteousness. Uh, that's what the Holy Spirit convicts of. It, you're violate When you violate your conscience and you're living double-minded, you, you kind of know. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, absolutely. And... I knew how wretched I was. So I was like, I, I, if, if, and if I treated myself this way, Richard, can you imagine how I treated other people? Like badly people, people were the sum of how dirty they were. That was what they were. And it was just like me. I'm just the sum of how disgusting I am. I was, and because of this rich, I was a shame magnet, man. Like anything that would bring shame. I labeled myself as that immediately. That must be who I am. Um, as you can imagine, true inti intimacy with people, with friends was nearly impossible. And in intimacy, I mean like vulnerability. To be friends with someone, to take on some of the, you know, burdens of each other. I, I could not give people my burdens. It was too disgusting. I was this like, you know, hideous thing. And I had an intense fear of rejection, like intense. So I would never put people in positions where they had to like choose me because if they didn't, it was a confirmation of my value. Like that's who I am. I, bro, it got down to like pick up sports games. Like it was, I, bro, it was crippling, you know, like, oh, you get picked last. Well, then you must be garbage, you know? Um, hmm. And I was only as good as my life was going. Um, and if it was going bad, I couldn't run to God. The father hated me <laughs> and I had disappointed Jesus with my life. And so the Holy Spirit couldn't work in my life. That was the, the dots that I had connected. Um, and I didn't deserve him whatsoever.
So gradually I became disillusioned with life, Rich. Like I couldn't feel because of my later on in life, I would learn like some of the ways that lust, especially lust, um, affects the brain. Like you, you lose the ability to feel the highs of life, like the good stuff, because mm -hmm. you're a dopamine machine and your sensitivity has gotten so low to it, or I don't know how to say this properly, but you just, something intense has to happen for you to feel any form of enjoyment and satisfaction. And so you, I became disillusioned with life. I couldn't feel the highs. So I searched the world high and low putting on identities to see what does this, does this shirt give me a thrill of life? You know, does this thing bring me a thrill of life? Does this, and, and nothing did. Um, so my brain had kind of lost a function. Um, and I, I, I could talk myself, you know, as a hopeless optimist, like I kind of, I guess, um, I, I could talk myself out of the lows by like recklessly believing a future high that could possibly fix me, you know? And it was this person that decided, okay, well, I'm going to take my talents to this school in Tennessee called Southern Adventist University. Uh, my brother graduated in 2006, and I had hung around Miami for two years going to community college. I worked as a barista at Starbucks. Um, and when he decided, he graduated high school, and he decided to go to, to Southern, I was like, I might as well go with him. So I went. Southern Adventist University. <laughs> I arrived and that was in short, my notes say best years of my life up to that point. I made friends hmm. at Southern that I still, I would say 90% of my friends that I have to this day, I met at Southern Adventist University. Um, hmm. I, I met people there that had been on this podcast. Um, I met Byron Rivera. And Sean Ancheta, very early. I met Byron in 2006. Um, more on them later. Uh, I saw from a distance these two people you may have heard of, uh, Jayla and Eddie. I actually saw them become a couple from a distance, safe distance. I didn't really know them. Um, I had classes Who with Who is Fleur. that Peruvian guy with that 6'2"? Black, with white women is the only woman that when I talk to, I can see directly, straight ahead. I don't have to look down. I was bizarre. I'm six, six. So it's bizarre when I can talk to anyone, let alone a woman. And she's like at my eye line. Um, and because she's thin, she, she's taller than me somehow. Um, so, um, I had classes with floor. I had science classes with floor cause I was going to be a doctor. <laughs> I'm not laughing. <laughs> no, you should laugh. You're I'm absolutely gonna a doctor. <laughs> You're going to be a doctor dog. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was in a friend group of, of a bunch of ladies that sang with Joyce. So I met Joyce a long time ago. Good people. Um, the affirmation that I received for being whatever version of myself I decided to be that day was insane at Southern. White people walk around with a confidence. Again, I'm from Miami, dog. I've never seen white people, like really gotten to know white people before. And these kids from like Pisgah and GCA um, and Forsyth Academy, because believe it or not, there's white kids there. Like it was wild to see the confidence that these kids walked around with. Look at these Living white in the, people in their natural habitat. And their natural habitat at Towels <laughs> Hall. These white boys walking around, going into community shower without a towel on, covering like completely just, hey, this is who I am. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, you are crazy. This is insane. You know, great people. Again, it's just not the same. I, I went to day school. Like I had never had a dorm experience. And the now, dorm let's talk experience, about that for a second. Us, us day school kids. We were not ready. No, dog. We were not, not, not at all. We were not ready for the dorm, dude. Not at all. bro. And like on top of it, like in my day school days in high school, I lived like 30 miles from school. So I never hung out with my friends on the weekends because I didn't have a car. I had, for some bizarre reason, I don't remember anymore. I didn't have a license. So I couldn't drive and go hang out with friends. So I was, I had, I had the day school experience without any weekends. So when I got to Southern and I could hang out with my friends at night, 
in the dorm or, you know, I, I had friends on both sides. I had friends in the girls dorm and I had friends in the guys dorm. And I look, I'm not going to put it lightly. I became popular for the first time in my life. People liked me, Richard. People I'm not going to sugarcoat this, bro. People I'm not going to sugarcoat it, bro. I was loved. Like I would walk into the cafeteria and I could walk up to almost every table and have a conversation with someone that I knew. And it was, it was crack for my soul. I love, I'm an extrovert as you cannot soul tell crack, as at they all. Know. Yeah, so, exactly. Um, and so uh, people were so comfortable with me and they were so kind. They knew how to pronounce my name, bro. Let me tell you, my name is Didier. Okay. It's French. Didier. There you yeah. go. Exactly. In Miami, I was Didier. <laughs> oh my gosh. I almost just vomited. Like, yeah, that's a terrible I, name. If, you're, if your name is Didier, it's a terrible name, but if it's Didier. Didier. I'm cultured now. I, I'm cultured. I'm suave. Like, I have culture that you have to now discover. You know, I'm interesting. Yeah. I'm intriguing. That's a French name. It's a, <laughs> a French name. A French name. A, a French name. Uh, if French you know, if you, if you know, you of know. course, Yvonne Sally. Um, so like, I'm just, I'm loving it. People are, I mean, even spiritual stuff. I'm like, okay, I'll go to worships. I'll go to Vespers, whatever. People dress really nice for first Vespers. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to show up and it's going to be amazing. And I met people that genuinely wanted to be friendly. Um, mm -hmm. Spiritual revivals for sure. Um, one year we had David Asherick come and did a whole week of prayer and the dude asked some really tough questions, really tough questions about things that I had been struggling with. Like, you know, I just as conversations with the, with the students, really good series. Um, and I, I just remember spiritual things like, uh, I just want to be friends with people. I want to, I want to collect the Pokemon cards of friends. I just want to be friends with everybody. Um, so I naturally, the next step after work, going to Southern Adventist university in the summers, what are you going to do? Check out no work at camp, of course. So in 2000, 2007, I started working at camp Kalakwa, um, just to hang out with my friends from Southern. Um, it was at camp Kalakwa that I met, um, some other people, Kessia, she was uh, a pastor for the week for the kids, but Kessia had a way of preaching that everyone in the crowd also was being preached to. She wasn't just preaching to the kids. Like the staff members were like, yes, Jesus loves me so much. She still oh is God. your favorite pastor's favorite pastor, man. She That's still right. is. She is. Um, and uh, I worked there for three summers, met some kids from Union that apparently you oh, know. My people. Um, and uh, it was great. I enjoyed it very much. And then in my third year, I got recruited by a guy named Abner Sanchez, a legend in my family, in my life, um, to work at Mount Etna Camp in Hagerstown, Maryland. It was at Mount Etna that I met my future wife. Um, I also met Connor Yonkers and Ben Williams, pre-gospel, I should say. Pre-gospel uh, pre Ben Williams and pre-gospel Connor? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. More on them in a little bit. Um, so, you know, these people, I just started meeting a lot of people at camp and pouring into kids the little that I understood, like the meager little drops in my, in, my, in my cup of what I understood about God. Um, and the mentorship that those kids received is actually was shocking to me. And, you know, I worked at camp with a bunch of my friends, people who have been on this podcast. And it was just these, we all discovered like this love for ministry somehow in some form or another, um, because it was just seeing these kids coming back the next year, asking to be with you because they saw some version of God that was beneficial to them, that changed their lives in some way. Um, and that, that felt really good. Um, but, you know, I'd leave camp and then the, the guilt of my sinful ways got so bad that I would resort to like white knuckling, you know, you know, white knuckling, like 
I'm going to read Ellen White devotionals from, from the morning. I'm going to read the spirit of prophecy in the afternoon. And, uh, but not the great controversy because that book freaks me out. But like, you know, the pay trust and prophets, let's do it. I'm, I'm about it. You know, putting alarms on my phone every 12 minutes to pray, like just white knuckling it. And it never really worked. Um, I tried listening to sermons by all kinds of pastors. Um, when I felt, you know, out of whack spiritually, I would just watch sermons to, to kind of like wake me up and it would work for a while, but it didn't really take root. Um, it took a year to go to France because I got tired of being, of introducing myself to someone. They would say, oh, Didier, that's a French name, right? Do you speak French? And I'd say, no, I speak Spanish. And they're like, what? <laughs> so I got tired of that. And I went to Colonge sous Salève. Um, the, the Adventist, um, Spanish, uh, French, French I was, I was at a level, there's like, there's like four levels of French fluency that you need to like, there's four levels that they categorize you for the top level. Like you can go to university. The second, to top level, you get, you pretty much speak like a high schooler. I was the third level. Um, so it was better than nothing. And I had, I spoke no French because my dad at home. My dad found English so much more efficient to communicate in that he never tried to teach us French. I mean, when I was a little boy, but it didn't, I don't remember any of it. Um, Would you say it's a difficult language? It's probably the hardest of the romance languages uh, for the simple fact of the faux amis, the false friends, um, because articles in French are almost always opposite to what they are in Spanish and Italian and Portuguese. Romanian, I, there's no way I was going to learn Romanian, but like I can understand Italian pretty well. I speak Spanish. Portuguese, especially Brazilian Portuguese, super easy to understand. But French was impossible because French is really, really hard. It's, it is the, I think it's the toughest romance language to learn. But I enjoyed it. I did things in France that I had experiences in France. I, I wasn't really a drinker, but I drank in France. I wasn't really a smoker, but I smoked in France. Did a lot of things that I don't think I needed to do, but I was so curious as to what that was like. And so I indulged in them. Um, but it, coming back to the States wasn't hard. Um, I came back to the States and I met my wife. Well, I met, I met a lady named Lindsay um, and we started dating. It was my first girlfriend was my first. It was the, my first kiss. I was 26. Yeah, I was 26, 24. Sorry, I was 24. It was my first kiss, my first girlfriend. Um, I mean, just, and so like when people would hear that from me, they'd be like, really? And I'd be like, yeah, I know it's embarrassing. They're like, no, that's beautiful. And I'm like, what that, what that doesn't, Okay, cool. Um, but she was, she was super special. Um, uh, the thing about Lindsay was that, you know, <sighs> Lindsay did something radical for me. She, she found me like the real me and she found me interesting. Like mm. she would ask me about me, not, not like who I could, what I could offer her, what um what we could connect on that she liked no 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 she wanted to know what i liked and she found what i liked interesting again i did not know this was possible there's a lot of parts of my story from high uh, university from southern that i all the girl disappointments that i don't really talk about because they don't really matter you yeah. know meeting her was really special for me um i didn't think it was possible to find someone that actually saw me the real me and like liked me. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I graduated from Southern with not pre-med. Um, I graduated with a degree in mass communications with an emphasis in international studies, the most vague degree ever. Yeah. With, with that kind of degree, you can work at Chick-fil-A. Absolutely. You, work at Hobby Lobby. <laughs> you could be a translator for nobody because you're not proficient. <laughs> <laughs> in uh, French, not to that level, um, with a minor in photography. Okay. And photography, you know, speaking about looking for a place to put my identity, photography really became that thing. Um, 
if I took a bad photo and someone critiqued it, my life would fall apart, basically. Like, I put my entire identity into photography. At this Southern, like, like, when photography was popping, too. Was popping. I had a friend, um, Natalie Mazzo, who I think you know. Um, For sure. She was a recruiter at Southern. And she, I would go to her house and we'd talk about photography incessantly. She'd show me the photos that she was taking, the, the, the sessions. And, you know, I learned a lot from her. I, photography just became everything. 2000 and, yeah, 2008, 2009. Photography, DSLRs were like really popping back then. Um, and so I adopted that. That's when identity. I started my blog that was about photography. Let's go. Was it on Tumblr? I had a Tumblr, but it was it was called okay. loves to picnic.com and it was I just bought a DSLR and started taking yes. whack photos. I ended up becoming Let's better, but they still just whack. Let's go. Dude, my blog was called My Curious Right Eye. <laughs> and it was just all the photography that I could find that I could shoot myself and just posting it. And I I was Look, I'm I'm a different person today than I was back then as far as an artist. And so I look back on those photos and I laugh, you know, nowadays, but it was good to just create. It felt amazing um, to come up with an idea that I wanted to execute. That was very rare. Like, how often do you get that chance to like say, I want to shoot something like this and then go and try and make it? It's a lot of fun. Um, so when I, when we started dating, you know, I taught Lindsay about photography. We shot some weddings, you know, it was a lot of fun. Um, but then as, as we got married, I brought all the baggage that I had mentioned before, all of that stuff. I had kind of brought that into my marriage. Um, I had an incessant need for affirmation, still had the lust issues. Um, I thought that the, the old familiar story that I thought marriage would fix my lust issues. Nope. Um, Hold up, Mary didn't fix your lust issues? Sure did. We need to, we need to go back to the drawing board. <laughs> um, I, I, I will say, though, that I, I had found, God had found someone for me. Um, she was so patient with me. She was so different from me. Um, Lindsay is a very introverted person, very introspective, um, very, very thoughtful, very... Um, the slow to speak, quick to listen. I'm kind of the up the way around. And her confidence in God was wild to me. Like when things got bad, she didn't turn to anxiety. Her first thing was to turn to God. And I was like, this is what, how do you even do this? That is wild. Um, she just had a different way of thinking to mine, you know? And uh, yeah. I I did, I couldn't run to God because he would condemn me. That dude hated right. the father. He hated me, but she would run to him. And I'm like, that is what, how to, to have your confidence. My goodness. Um, so she was that adventure that I had longed for, for so long. And, and God was very merciful to me with that. Getting to know her, like the real her was like the honor of my life and a privilege that I cherish to this day. It wasn't perfect. Our marriage wasn't perfect, but it was beautiful. It was mine. I couldn't believe I was. I, I, at 24 years, before I met her, I was like, marriage is never going to happen for me. This is not a thing. Like, I didn't have a girlfriend. I never had a girlfriend. And so to be married, I was just like, wow, I'm fortunate. Uh, in 2018, we got married in 2013. Um, in 2018, we had our little boy named Olivier. And I, I'm kind of rushing through my life because I just want to get to the life. I, I don't let's get to it. I, let's get to the life, man. I, so I had my son getting bad. I, I want to hear how it's getting Yeah. Um, I just want to get to the life. So um I had a little boy. We have a little boy named Olivier. Um and when he was born, Rich, like the the early glimpses of a true gospel started to lay their foundation. He, unbeknownst to me. Because I would like, I would look at this boy and I would say to myself, how can I see him as anything other than precious? How, hmm. how can, how can it be possible that he is anything other than precious, than like dear to me? 
Is it possible that God? Is it possible that God? No. Stop it with your foolishness, DBA. <laughs> You're a sinner. Remember? And time passed. And as time passed, this cognitive dissonance, like I was so uncomfortable with a divide between the things I believed and my behaviors and how inconsistent and contradictory I was. So I spiraled, you know. Um, and one day in December of 2021, uh, um, Byron had this thing where he would just call me at once a month, just for no reason, for years. And I mean, I would say Byron was supposed to be in my wedding. He was supposed to be one of my groomsmen, but a funny thing happened. His daughter was born on the week of my wedding and he couldn't make it to my wedding. It was fine. I was not mad. I, I know. So I put my dad in my wedding, which was a master stroke because yeah, you'll hear about that in a little bit. Um, but I, I was spiraling. And Byron calls me and I'm, I'm so fed up with like my inability to conform with what I knew it was right somehow, what I thought was right. Um, and so he spoke life to me. He told me, I want you to read a book. I don't even remember the name of the book. And I want you to also do a second thing for me. I want you to listen to a podcast. And he said, it's called the death to life podcast. And I was like, all right, cool, cool, cool. That sounds, it's an interesting name for a podcast. Um, okay. So on January 16th, 2022, and I remember it. I remember this day. What a glorious day. I remember this day because it was the first time in my life where I had that moment in Jaws where the camera pushes in, but the camera's being, but the, the lens is zooming in, but the camera's pulling out. I'm driving home. The dolly shot. And, the dolly shot. And I hear Tyler, this guy named Tyler, who sounds exactly like one of my friends that I went to France with. The dude is so gregarious. Tyler felt like a party that I really wanted to go to. And I'm listening to this guy talking about his life and the way he explains things. And then he goes into something about freedom from sin. And I, I've heard a lot of people's different reactions to hearing that. I've listened to 154 episodes of this podcast at this point. And I've heard a lot of people's reactions to this. But my gut reaction, the first thing, and I remember saying it out loud in the car, I was like, this is the only way heaven makes sense. If, 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 if freedom from sin is a thing, then there's a chance for heaven. Because I went back to that thing my grandmother told me as a kid, you know, the only thing that changes is your body, but your character, it remains the same. And I was like, if, if, if all the things that this dude on this podcast is saying is true, then that's the only way like the one plus one equals two, two being heaven, one being like perfection, two being, oh, freedom from sin. In my early thoughts, it was, this is the only way this is possible. There's no other way that heaven makes sense. I've tried, well, I've incorrectly tried absolutely everything and it's all failed. This thing, this is the only way it makes sense. And I just remember, Richard, have you ever driven a road like a lot, but then one day you have to walk that same road. Tell me more. <laughs> have, has that, if that's happened to you, like it's happened to me, you start to notice different things. Normally when you're driving, you don't look so much what's around you. You keep on looking at where you're going because you're a safe driver and you want to keep your discount with State Farm. But like, when you get to walk, when you have to walk that same road, you have time to look in little alleyways and different businesses along the road. And you realize there's things there that you never saw. That's what listening to this podcast felt like. Because I saw things, I heard things and links started making like click, things started clicking that how could I have never seen this before? It, but it was always there. 
Um, wow. So my core takeaway from listening to Tyler's podcast was I am free from sin. Episode. Just the first episode. Oh, this his podcast was the best news I've ever heard. Like, this was like, okay, spirituality might be possible. If this thing is true, spiritual excuse me, spirituality could probably, like God and everything, that might actually have hope. And what I took away from that podcast after listening to Tyler's episode was the gospel isn't a hammer this exceedingly burdensome thing that bludgeons you to death. That's not how God loves you. That's not how God speaks to you. He speaks to you in love. And I started listening to Morgan's episode. And Morgan's episode was, I mean, if anything, it was even, it was just as powerful. And I was just like, I'm hearing different sides of this story and I'm seeing a picture of God. And immediately, this beautiful thing happened. Like, Jesus, this notion that, like, started hitting me. Like, Jesus wasn't, like, this rogue agent of heaven that, like, somehow came on a mission to pacify the wrath of the Father. No. Jesus was the Father coming down to us. And immediately, like... Oh, oh, you mean for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And then the second verse, the next one, that one, ooh, for God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. This whole time, my distorted view of the father, the father loves me. Because he reveals himself in the person of Jesus to give me, to restore me to something. Again, I had never, never heard that. It was wild to me. Um, because God has a bias towards saving, Richard, and not shaming and condemning, you know? And he came to rescue lost daughters and sons. Rescue from what? I'm like, well, what could he be rescuing me from? Well, death, you know? Um, and listening to the first, you know, five, six episodes, I was like, wait, I can be liberated from all the stuff that I've believed about myself for so long. Um, and I just remember like, okay, now I have to go home and fact check this stuff. Like, Lord, please let this stuff be true. Please, please let this be true. And I felt, I, I, I had, I, I felt it freed me from the condemnation of what I knew the law said. And I was just like, Lord, this feels right, but like, please let it be true. Okay, we are going to take a quick break from the episode and I'm bringing on my guy, Hui Fam. Hui, what's going on, my brother? Not much, but my account on here says Hui and BB. And if you want to hear a funny story, Michael Loomis thought that my wife Bibi's name was Queen Bibi because everybody referred to both of us at the same time and it sounded like Queen Bibi when they were actually saying Hui and Bibi. So I just refer to you guys as Huibi when I talk to <laughs> when I talk about you guys. I'm like, yo, where's Huibi? So Hui, question for you. How long have you been rocking with the gospel, my friend? Since 2018. Since 2018. What has the gospel done in uh, changing your life? It has set the correct lens to discern everything. Like, so before I did not have a way of discerning what is right and wrong, what is good or bad with clarity, the clarity that I have now because my identity has been, has been firmly established and the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. Hmm. So when you ask how, what has it, how, what is the impact or effect of the gospel on my life? It is in the smallest decisions, the biggest decisions. And, uh, and all of those decisions now I know are uh, clearly lead to life and I'm no longer second guessing, uh, any of the any of the 
big or small decisions that I make because I don't not seek the counsel of the spirit before making any decisions. So. Wow, man. You, you have given of your energy, of your time, years of your finances, uh, you have sacrificed to keep this message going forward. Why is that so important to you? Because if we talk about the idea of prosperity, right? Because if we talk about the idea of prosperity, mm -hmm. I, my, my fundamental, the fundamental shift in my investment strategy has gone from material to people because the scripture says very clearly the return on investment that God is looking for from all of his children on earth is more people. That is the game that we are playing, that we are playing. We are in a, a war game with the world to bring more of his children home by setting them free here and now. And so if there is no other point, what is the purpose? The Christian always asks, what is our purpose? There is only one, to pay forward the message that sets you free, to deliver others from what you have been delivered from, and in so setting them free from the sin that binds them. And the point of it is that they could come home. The point of it is that they would take their seat at the table in heavenly places. And so there is no greater purpose, right? Especially in this time and place, there is no greater purpose, right? Is worship God, love, love God and love others, right? How do you love others now? <laughs> you set them free, right? So, uh, so yeah, 100% return on investment, right? That's what God wants from us. And so if we have been set free, then we pay it forward. Man, if you want to partner with us, if you're listening to this and you're like, I, I want to, I want to help with this message that sets people free. You can go to lovereality.org slash give. And every dollar you give goes towards this message getting out there, whether through this podcast, whether through Bible study, whether through uh, one of the other podcasts that we have, the Love Reality Group, every single dollar goes towards getting the message that Christ has reconciled the world back to God to these people out here. So that's lovereality.org slash give and man we would love it if you moved with us to get this thing going forward hui man thank you so much my brother peace i had no idea who who jonathan leonardo was um when i actually turned on youtube and i got to wave one on pvc i actually started the champion series and it didn't make any sense to me so i was like i'm gonna maybe i clicked the wrong link i'm gonna go to the pvc one <laughs> I didn't know what PVC was. So this dude starts preaching. I, I, am, I have a custom at work because I do creative work. I watch YouTube on the side as I'm editing or editing photos or editing video as I, I work in, in a creative field. And Jonathan starts talking about his identity, how he, how he claimed the wrong identity. And Richard, after 20 minutes, I, Jonathan, how do I say that I cried so hard I had boogers coming out of my face and I had to run to the bathroom several times because Jonathan, I, Jonathan verbalized things about things that I believed about myself that I couldn't believe someone knew, that someone thought the same way. I felt so seen in deception which was wild because like the things he said, it was like, I believe that. And that's not true. <laughs> Tell me more. And so I, so the thing that really hit me in his presentation was when were they free? When were they free? Were they free when they had gone through everything? No, they were free when he said they were free. And I was like, free freedom. And you guys used to throw, you would throw around this, this, this term in your podcast. It was when I got free, when I got free, when I got free. And I was like, bro, you don't get free. He frees you, but you don't get it. Like you don't do it yourself. But then like, then little by little, I was like, wait, when did I understand this? 
When did this actually happen? It happened a long time ago. I, I can't, I don't know how to express it, but like, I have freedom now. It's not this thing. I, I, I'm not going to work towards this. This is something that starts now. And I'm like, this is, this is wild. This is revel. This is, I've never heard anything like this. Hmm. And that my life begins from freedom, not to freedom. I had never heard that that idea like and it, i literally was hanging on to everything this dude is saying anytime he made a joke i was laughing anytime he would speak something ridiculous i would be like oh my gosh this makes so much sense i i didn't know how else to explain it so when he said he said that my ability to sin didn't identify me as anything other than what he says i am I am running to the bathroom. Like I am, I can't look professional if I'm crying this much, you know? And I, I'm just, I'm listening to this, to the, to the first episode. And then I immediately click to the second one, the prodigal son or the, the parable of the faithful father, as TJ would say. And I'm just like, this is the most beautiful story I've ever heard, but I'm always a son. What? Because I, the law taught me to grovel. Like that was, that's how I had, I had to, I had to like create this distance between myself, the trash that I believed that I was, that, that was what created the distance for then him to then like his goodness to look like goodness. Cause I, I, I had to be garbage in order for him to look amazing. And then there was a justification for Jesus. And Jonathan said that. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, this, I, this, I've never experienced anything like this. And I was hungry, bro. I was just like the sun. I was hungry. And then Jonathan hits me with that. I'm dead to the law. What? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, dude, no, that I had never heard that. But the thing was, I, it, I didn't reject it. I was like, please let this be true. The fact that Jonathan was Adventist, like you just, had never heard that. No, dog, no, nah, never. Bro, I was the the law was the rubric. And if that wasn't right, and if I didn't match up to that, I'm doomed. That's it. And I'm like, I'm not under the law. This is the best news I've ever heard. Like, what? And, and then I'm under grace. This I don't even know what that means. And Jonathan explains this, and I, I had, like, a part of me was just so welcoming. Um, all of me was so welcoming because he goes, the, the, the verse in Luke 15 says that the father, the father, when the son was a long way off, his father ran to him. I, bro, I tell you, like, erect me because for so long, I'm going to get emotional. Okay, calm down. For so long, the lies that I believed about myself, that was what I allowed to define me. But Jesus, seeing me, the Father, seeing me from a long way off, starts running towards me to get to me before the lies can destroy me. I had that image in my mind. And I'm thinking, so wait, if, if the father is for me, who, who told me that I was trash? Like who holds that smoking gun? Who, who calls me? Who's calling me a slave? Like who calls me trash? And the, the spirit puts sp scripture in you, man. I'm telling you, Matthew 13, 28, Jesus says, an enemy did this. Hmm. There is no truth in the enemy. And thank God I'm not under the law because there is no mercy there either. And understanding that you are free from the law to because you are now married to another. Like, did you, how quick did that concept start to land? Um, the concept was a beautiful thing 
that I believed conceptually, but in my heart, it took a long time, much longer than I'm happy to admit, because the tendency was to run back to the thing, the old pattern of thinking, the double-mindedness, the sin consciousness. And the, the freedom, the freedom from the hold of the law, the dead to sin, the freedom from sin, like that was so revolutionary. It took me, I, I was so happy that like I, in my head, it made sense, but it didn't make sense in my, my actions. And I identify with that Roman seven guy so much. First of all, let me just back up. Up until this point in my life, before I started watching, before I learned the podcast, like Romans had one chapter, it's chapter eight. Okay. Ephesians only had one chapter. It was the chapter about the armor of God. I had never read the book of Colossians. I thought that Richard, that you made up the title death to life. Like, I thought you made that up. I was like, oh, that's pretty cute. No clue that Jesus says it in John. Like, no notion of that. And I, oblivious to what the gospel was actually saying this whole time. And when Jonathan, when I'm reading, when I'm listening to you guys in the podcast, especially talking about Romans 6, Romans 6, Romans 6, I was like, okay, I'm going to open the book of Romans. And Holy Spirit, you have to make it make sense. Because this book is spaghetti soup for me. Like this is, I've never even tried to read this book because it never made any sense. And immediately, <laughs> it's like the most simple thing in the world, Richard. Like consider yourselves dead to sin. You were, you died with Christ. You resurrected with him in the newness of life. How can, how could it be any other way? How does any other way make sense, DDA? And it's like, Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. It's in the book. And I, I kept hearing you guys saying this and I'm like, but it is, it really is. Um, and that was really the thing that got me to this other like incredible thing, which was the secret place, the secret so, place. When hold you on, before, before you go to the secret place, when I first saw you, <laughs> It might have been like on a Friday night thing, like this is back in the day when we were doing those Friday yeah, nights. This was this was this was probably January of no January or February of 2022. And you were chilling, but then when you grabbed the mic, you just like took over like a force field. Like you were just like, oh Jesus, like you took over. And I was like, how much how how much did you understand? Had this already happened with you? listening to Jonathan preach this stuff? Um, I watched Wave 1 twice. Then I watched it a third time with my mom. Then I watched it a fourth time with my wife. Then I would watch it with anyone that would sit next to me long enough. I would send the podcast. I must have listened to episode 57, Theology and Freedom. I think at this point, at that point, I listened to it like four or five times because I wanted to understand the mechanism. I'm not a very technical person, but the spirit did this wild thing that like he told the Holy Spirit told me, like, search me. I am able to be found. So like dive in. Why not? And I kept learning and learning and learning. And I would tell anyone that would listen to me about it. And honestly, some lies started to creep in like, uh -huh. Oh, you just want to talk. Oh, you just want to, you just want to show people, you know, all of the lies that I used to believe about myself. And actually I fell into some deception about that. And I, I actually withdrew a little bit from, um, some of the gatherings because I was like, you're only there to talk. You're not there to listen. You're not there to be spiritually present and share in the body of Christ. You just want to talk. And I tried to believe those lies. And, you know, anyway, it, it was rough because, you know, when you, when you 
when you see the encouragement that Jesus gives to his disciples as he leaves the earth, he tells them, I promise you there's going to be trouble. Like life isn't going to be beautiful. It's not going to be perfect. You're not, bad things are going to happen, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And for me, that notion was like, okay, so life isn't going to be this beautiful, a steady sea never made a skilled sailor. I had to take that to heart, you know? And um, I remember when I joined the sessions at first, I, I was just on fire. I was on fire. And that fire lasted like, let me put it to you this way. In 2020, my dad got diagnosed with cancer during COVID. 2021, in October of 2021, my mom got diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer. Um, in January of 2022, I heard the gospel for the first time in my life. On March 26, 2022, my dad died out of nowhere um, from cancer. And I, that doesn't sound like it makes sense, but like he went to the hospital for a routine draining of his lung and he coded and died out of nowhere. Um, if it hadn't been for the gospel, if it hadn't been for the beauty of the message that I had heard, I don't think I would ever have turned to God, that I would have ever been able to survive the times that I went through with the death of my dad. Um, my dad was someone that... <sighs> Um, I, I just, I thought that I would have, so I, 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 I learned about, I, I got free in January of 2022. The first thing that I did was tell my mom about it. I would call my mom on my way to work and on my way home and just tell her everything that the Holy Spirit was really revealing to me. Everything I learned in wave one, all the podcasts, I, every piece of information that I got, I would share it with her. Um, because my parents, again, they weren't really spiritual. But my mom, after her cancer diagnosis, I think life started to make more sense to her and she wanted to hear more about God. Um, and I, I told my mom and I tried telling my dad, but it didn't really make a lot of sense to him. He had no foundation for spiritual stuff. The only spiritual stuff he, had, he knew was when every time that he would visit my grandmother, my grandmother would sit him down and tell him about prophecy. So like he didn't have a basis for like understanding the gospel and the love of God and that kind of stuff. So I, I say that I ultimately didn't have enough time to tell him about Jesus, but you know, I had that, and that was a lot for me to process, but, um, but if it wasn't for the gospel, I wouldn't have been able to, if it wasn't for freedom, if it wasn't for understanding who I am, my what my identity actually is, that I'm always a son, I would never have made it through those times. And, you know, the secret place, the whole concept of the secret place, it's crazy because I said a lot of stuff about my grandmother, but my grandmother had a lot of beautiful things about her. My grandmother had a tree that she would pray at every day. It was her time with God. I, it was her secret place. And when I say secret place, to the person listening, it's this notion from Matthew chapter 6 and the Sermon on the Mount that when you pray, don't go praying around. And when you spend time with God, don't go lording it around for people to see it. But when you do it, go to a secret place, close the door, and your father who sees what's done in secret will reward. Like this notion of intimacy, an intimacy with your father. And I started doing that. Um, and the revelations that God gave me in the secret place were stuff I, stuff that I've, I don't think I've ever, I've shared it with Byron, but just things that, concepts that I had never even begun to believe I would be able to understand one day. Um, and one of the things that emerged for me was like, folks, read your Bibles. <laughs> like, I thought I knew the Bible, but it turns out my understanding of what the Bible was, was skewed completely. And it was completely incomplete. Um, and there's so much understanding in that for me. And 
once these things came into focus and uh, being being free, uh, being free to love people, be free to love humanity, being free to love myself, to treat myself and to see myself as reckoning myself as dead to sin and alive in Christ, the the alignment and the vertical and horizontal alignment of reality became a thing for me. Vertically aligned because I am loved by the Father. I am redeemed by his Son, and I'm empowered by his Spirit. I am reconciled. In him, I have every spiritual blessing in the heavens. And then horizontally aligned because I am free to love humanity at all costs. I, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And I can look at others the way God sees them. And I always turn to this funny story. I was on TikTok a long time ago, and I was watching this interview um, with A.J. Brown, a wide receiver for the, he had just signed for the Philadelphia Eagles. And he's wearing this chain around his neck, and it says LJ or something. And a reporter asks him, um, you have a teammate named Larry Johnson. I don't know what his name was. Are you wearing his name around your neck? And J.J. Brown looks at the guy and he goes, do you really think I would wear another man's name around my neck? And for so long, I had adopted this identity of disgusting trash or cast out and disgusting and broken. And that's not my chain to wear. That's not the identity that I have around my neck. The, the identity that God says about me, whatever it is that he says about me, that is my identity. That's who I am. That's how he sees me. And so I live from there. And um, I focus on the things above because I'm not what the enemy tries to say that I am. What he lied to me for so long about, I'm not that person. And so since then, um, yeah, I've just, it's not been a cakewalk. It's been hard at times, you know, my dad dying and struggling with COVID, believe it or not, and seasonal affective disorder and a bunch of stuff. Um, but through it all, first and foremost, operating from the notion that I am loved desperately and that I am, the father himself loves me that I'm free from the condemnation. I'm free from the shame, guilt, and condemnation that I had put myself into for so long. And I, that, that changed me. Man, if, if you got to go back, let's go. Where are we going? Guess where I'm taking you. I don't know. Tell me. We're going back to high school. Mm. Because... When you started getting all that affirmation, it was the mask to what you truly believed about yourself, right? I don't know if it changed until, you know, you just were hiding it because people are sweeter in college than they are in high school. Sure. High school, I think, it seems more like real life than college. Yeah. High school, like, because people are, they're just, they're not trying to hide anything. They're kind of being their jerk selves if they're jerks. Yeah. If you got to to run into this kid, put your arm around him, what would you tell this guy? I would tell that kid, that awkward, super tall, afro-haired kid in the humidity, I would tell him, you are radically loved by a father that is obsessed with you and chose you before the world was made. The proof of this is that he sent his son on a mission to bring you back to himself, to be set apart, blameless, and above any form of shame or condemnation. And because of this, you are free to be what he created you to be, to have his spirit inside of you. And no one, no lies of the enemy can change that. Man, we've been hanging out here. You said January 2022? January 16th of 2022. Hearing you guys. You first time. Did I meet you in 2023? When was the first time I met you? No, you met I me that same year. You, you met me that same year. You came to Atlanta because you were going to a Chiefs game. And I met you at a pizzeria with my wife and son. And you wanted to stay with us, but I didn't have any space because we lived in a tiny apartment and we didn't have a guest room or anything. 
And um, it was, <laughs> it was, I'm not going to lie to you, bro. I was nervous, man, because I was like, this is the podcast maker. Like this dude, I've listened to this guy's voice as much as I've listened to like, like my wife's voice. Like I listen to this guy every single day. It was wild. No, man, it was so good to meet you. And I think that's probably the only time we've been around each other in person. Yeah, um, it was. But you've been a testimony on the pod or on the Bible studies on internet church and your energy. Like nobody, like you're a special and significant part of the body of Christ and nobody can do the work that God has specifically set aside for you to do. And I'm seeing you do it. And it's just a blessing, man your energy for the Lord. So I want to thank you for your faithfulness to his faithfulness. And I'm sure that you are shining. If you're still working at that school, I, you still are. I'm sure you're shining there. And uh, you're a bright star, man. And so uh, thank you for sharing your story. And it, I, it's just powerful, man. It blows me away. Praise God. Praise God, brother. Man, if if you are in a spot where you are the sum of all the things that you've done and you're living with that shame and there's no way God can love you, if you're in that spot, then this prayer is for you. Father, I'm, I'm hearing the lies that position me as less than and I hear that it isn't true, that you see me as the pearl of great price and that you laid your life down for me. And so my value is that. Please give that to me so I can be convicted of it in my heart. I have it in my head, but move it to my heart so that I can believe because I am struggling to believe. I know you will do it because I'm praying it in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, join our circles, Bible study. Go to lovereality.org. Go to circles. We want to hang out with you every day of the week. We hang out every day of the week, and we want to do that with you. So check it out, lovereality.org, circles, and let's go. Let's hang out Bible studies all day every day, not all day, but every day. Love y'all. Appreciate y'all.